If you paid attention to computers in this past year and you cut videos every day like I do, I bet you're tired of hearing how great the new Apple Silicon M1 chip is when you just knew it didn't have enough RAM or even enough ports to get any real work done. But now the M1 Pro and the M1 Max computers are out with literally everything we could have hoped for in a laptop for video editing. We already know it has excellent geeky benchmarks, but what I wanna know is if this M1 Max MacBook Pro can replace the need for a dedicated Mac Pro cheese grater which costs over twice the price. Therefore, today, we're cutting to the chase with seven real-world video editing tests in DaVinci Resolve comparing the M1 Max against the Mac Pro. This 14-inch M1 Max MacBook Pro has a 10-core CPU, a 24-core GPU, a 2TB blazing fast internal SSD, and the maxed out 64 gigabytes of unified memory. DaVinci Resolve can use that memory, reducing the need to swap memory across to the SSD. The 2019 Mac Pro over here has a 3.3 gigahertz 12-core Intel Xeon processor with an AMD Radeon Pro 580X 8GB GPU, also with a two terabyte internal system drive and a whopping 96 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. That machine's a beast and it's got the price tag to show for it. Oh, and just for context and perspective here, I've been editing professionally for nearly 20 years doing commercial work for one of the top global ad agencies in the world and also in the nonprofit space for a large house of worship here in Colorado. I also spent several years as a post-production director of technology. And the point is, is that I've loved computers ever since I built my first PC as a teenager with my dad and cutting video is not just my career, it's still my passion. Now under the test. To even the playing field, all the tests use the same Samsung T7 NVMe SSD. This drive is what I recommend most video editors use if you don't already have an external SanDisk drive. We're gonna hit start. And it looks like we're about 750 megabytes per second, both on read and for write. Next, I wanna find out how fast the drive inside the MacBook Pro is. And... Holy cow. Oh my gosh. Over 6,000 and 5,000 megabytes per second. And now I want to see how fast the internal drives are on the Mac Pro. All right, not so bad. I can work with that. So between 2,000 and 2,800 megabytes per second. When you're the DIT on set or you sit back at your desk with an SD card, you need to get those video files off the card. And the new Mac Pro has a UHS-2 card slot for that. So for the laptop, we're going to use the built-in slot. And for the Mac Pro, we're going to use my favorite four-slot SD card reader from StarTech. <laughs> this thing is so good, I should probably do a video on it. I've got almost exactly 50 gigabytes of real footage here on the Sony V90 UHS-2 card, which I'm gonna plug right into the MacBook Pro. And we're gonna see how long it takes to copy on both machines straight over to the internal drive. So moving it to here, which is on the desktop, and start. Boom. Two minutes and 48 seconds. So the copy to the Mac Pro was actually faster than over to the MacBook Pro with the internal reader. My hunch is that it's actually the StarTech um, UHS-2 card reader here that is outperforming the internal one here on the MacBook Pro, but that was pretty interesting. It's still pretty fast either way when you're talking about 50 gigabytes. Now we get to see what the built-in media engine with multiple ProRes accelerators and dedicated hardware for H.264 and H.265 is all about. My biggest question for this test is, how does the timeline actually feel? When I push play, does it play? Does it respond? When I trim, does it trim? So I put together a timeline with a variety of notoriously hard to play back footage consisting of Sony XAVC HS H.265 10-bit 422, GoPro H.265 and H.264, DJI drone footage, Blackmagic RAW, and even the troublesome Canon R5 10-bit H.265 footage. Surprisingly, for the first time in my life, I've seen this all play back perfectly. It's like a miracle. In fact, I tried playing back four H.265 clips together in a multicam and it wasn't a problem. Smooth as silk. The only time I dropped frames with a MacBook Pro was trying to play back a nine camera angle multicam with 4K H.265 footage. That didn't work and everything just feels snappy and responsive when I'm trimming and scrubbing. Okay, now I'm looking at the Mac Pro to see how that performs. We're also at 3840 by 2160 on the timeline. Hit home, let's just hit L to play. And right off the bat, as soon as I hit play, my frame rate drops. But once it gets going, it does okay. See, what I like to do is I like to push play, and I like it to start playing right when I push play, not four seconds after. And then look at this kind of playback, 6.7 frames per second on a Mac Pro. <laughs> Four angles of multicam doesn't work. There's no way. It can't do it. It's terrible. 
Look at that. It's just, it feels sticky is what it feels. It feels really sticky. It's not super, super pleasant. I'm curious if the new DaVinci Resolve speed editor is also responsive. So let's take a look at the same timeline using only the speed editor to navigate and trim in the cut page. I kind of expected this, but the search dial on the speed editor in the cut page feels really smooth on the M1 Max MacBook Pro. It's almost as if the footage was already ProRes. Jog and scroll work great. Now the shuttle button is still pretty touchy, but it could be manageable with some finesse, although I pretty much avoid using shuttle control. It's really not the easiest control on the speed editor. Next, I just want to try how the speed editor works with the Mac Pro with this highly compressed and high res footage. I don't feel like it's going to be a whole lot better than the keyboard was. Oh boy. This really jumps all over the place. Let me go to the cut page and see if that's any different. So the cut page scroll definitely seems smoother right there than the edit page. So if we go to the edit page, it jumps all over the place which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's very, very stuttery here in the edit page. This is on the Mac Pro, but if I jump over shift three to get over here, my thumbnails are not updating, but at least <laughs> the search dial is moving really nice and smooth. You can see right there. So again, this is H.265 4K stuff. So this, this shouldn't play back. This is like a technological marvel that it even kind of works, but, um, you know, we saw much better performance on the MacBook Pro. That motion on these clips, it is, it's terrible. It's, it's pretty bad. I probably wouldn't use, I wouldn't use the speed editor in the edit page for this specific project unless I had transcoded the footage. Oh, hey, real quick, while we're on the topic of the speed editor, I wanna welcome you if you're new here because I have a lot of helpful tutorials on Resolve and the speed editor. I'm Chadwick and this is Creative Video Tips, which is here to help you craft stories that make a difference and stand out. So if you're into that, subscribe right now because it's free and maybe also hit that bell. It could be your good deed for the day. Making proxies has been part of my workflow ever since HD became a thing. And it's just one of those annoying things where you pay now or you pay later with your time. And in DaVinci Resolve, it ties up the application so you can't do anything else. So let's figure out how long it takes to make some ProRes proxy at 1080p on both machines. And we're transcoding 26 minutes of 4K footage. For the first time, I can start to hear fans starting to turn on here on the, uh, the M1 Max MacBook Pro. And stop. Three minutes, 17 seconds for the M1 Max MacBook Pro. And for the expensive Mac Pro, I had to keep waiting and waiting and waiting and done. Seven minutes and 56 seconds. We'll give it, it could be 57, we'll call it seven minutes and 56 seconds it took on the Mac Pro to make proxies. Where we were at three minutes and 17 seconds on the MacBook Pro. 317 versus 756, that is insane, the difference. Just to make ProRes proxy at 1080p, wow. The uh, ProRes accelerators that are in that thing, they exist apparently, they're doing their job. Render cache helps you smooth your playback when you have complicated composites or effects, but it often needs to recache with the simplest trim on the timeline. So let's see how fast rendering out a preview of a motion VFX title is. Now let's drag the all important thumbs up, okay? <laughs> and the bell down, because those are good things to do right now. And this test is on 10 seconds of 4K footage. And you can see our playback isn't so great right now because it needs to render. So we're gonna select the clips with user cache on and use render cache color output. And through the magic of editing, the M1 Max wins again at 33 seconds. So 43 seconds for the Mac Pro. And look, it's still not. <laughs> Even after render caching it, it's still not playing great. Look at that. So it was 43 seconds to draw a render cache on the Mac Pro and it didn't even work all that good, at least at 4K. Let's, let's see what it looks like at 1080. And just so you know, the laptop played 4K render cache no problem. Okay, it looks like it can play back 1080 with the, uh, the render cache fine. It just, it was struggling with 4K footage, so. The export render test is the classic YouTube computer benchmark. And while this doesn't matter too much for short videos, if you create hour long content for Sunday mornings, this could be a huge benefit to making sure you can wrap things up to watch that football game in the afternoon. I love that glitchy effect. So each of these is gonna be a quick export. The first one's ProRes and it's a one minute timeline. And it's all the footage we've been working with. And go. 
And this is where things really get crazy. Look at that, 15 seconds on the M1 Max versus 42 seconds on the Mac Pro for the one minute export. Now we're gonna export the exact same timeline with H.265 on both machines to see how that does. And go. I think I might be in love with this new laptop for real. Holy smokes. 17 seconds, not bad at all. <laughs> so 39 seconds for H.265, not too bad. It's actually faster to export the H.265 than it was the ProRes, which is kind of interesting. And go. Oh yeah, this is fast. 17 seconds M1 Max versus 61 on the Mac Pro. This is just, wow. Overall, I'd say playback feel is what has sold me on the M1 Max chip. So much of video editing is about feeling and rhythm and touch, so you can craft that perfect moment and evoke emotions. If a system's not responsive and you can't work faster than you can think, then it just bogs you down. It can be a drag. It doesn't just waste time, which is money, but it also kills your creativity. That being said, you can still edit anything on any old computer with proxy files, but for the first time in my editing career since trying to edit with highly compressed, high resolution codecs, I feel like this machine over here with DaVinci Resolve can handle anything I need it to without even needing to create those proxy files. That's dailies for those of you in LA or rushes if you're across the pond. I know you and I see you in the comments. I also won't feel tied down to a specific edit bay with the new MacBook. I love to camp in my Winnebago travel trailer in the summer, so now we can keep creating more creative video tips out on the road and in the mountains. Speaking of those tips, if you want to learn more about using DaVinci Resolve, I suggest you click this playlist right here. And because there's so much more to learn, I will see you in that next video.